Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with a township of Russell, Ontario, Councillor Lisa Deacon. Now, the township of Russell is nestled in the countryside of eastern Ontario. The township is a vibrant and welcoming community that beautifully blends rural charm with modern convenience. With a population of approximately 17,000 residents, this township is known for its tight-knit community spirit, rich history, and scenic landscapes. Now, the heart of Russell Township is the village of Russell itself, characterized by tree-lined streets, charming shops, and a warm community atmosphere. Residents and visitors alike will appreciate the friendliness and hospitality that defines this community, earning its reputation as a great place to live and visit. This is Cross Border Interviews with Councillor Lisa Deacon. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start at the beginning. And the beginning is to get to know the person behind the persona of a councillor. So I've got to ask, where does your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Lisa? Thanks. That's a great question. And thanks so much for having me on today. I It comes from a few places. Um, I'm still a fairly uh, relatively young leader in the community, um, but over the course of my life, there's a few key core memories that come to mind. And one of them is in the home and seeing my own parents get involved in their communities. My mom worked with children with disabilities in schools, as well as women who were experiencing intimate partner violence for many years. My dad was a local volunteer firefighter, uh, also a member of the Optimist Club. So those were those were really impressing on me when I was young. Um, fast forward, we were in a very small town and I had an itch to get out of that small town and see the world. And I had the opportunity to travel to many different countries. Um, one in particular that I lived in that didn't have democracy for many, many years, which was Chile in South, Southern America. And getting to know friends there and their stories, their families' experiences of living under a dictatorship um, for many years was really influential on my sense of uh, accountability and responsibility to be an active participant in our in our democracy here in Canada. Um, so those are a couple of, of big moments. More recently, before I ran, I was involved in um, supporting women to run for politics here locally. And uh, I got the call from a mentor that I really admire who said, by the way, there's no men on the ballot in your municipality. What are you going to do about it? So I thought, OK, now's my time to step up. And I got my name on there and worked really hard to get elected. So um, it's all embedded in community. It's all embedded in what I saw, what I learned from other people. And, and that's how I hope to continue serving others is the listening and the learning from them. So what was the draw locally? Because it's basically the crux of the entire uh, show is why people get involved municipally. By that uh, introduction, it sounds like with the background, with your mother's uh, history, with helping uh, vulnerable people, provincial politics would have been something you'd be interested in. Federally, because you went to Chile and you lived uh, abroad for a while, it would have been a relatively easy r run federally. But at the end of the day, in 2022, you chose municipally, local government. What was the draw for you locally? Um, I'm sure you've heard many people say this. I've never really planned to get into politics. <laughs> so it wasn't a matter of, I want to be a politician. Which level do I want to work at? For me, it was really just living in my community. I'm a mother of young children. Uh, I'm passionate about getting um, local uh, underrepresented voices to the table. Um, so that was a big part of it for me. Um, I think that it's a great way for those who do want to get involved in higher levels of politics that they, they can step in through committee or council work here to do so. Um, for me, this is the extent of my aspirations is serving the local community. And I think really at the end of the day, it's because I love people so much and the interaction with my neighbors and what's happening in our day-to-day -day lives and how that reverberates into our province and our country. Um, it, it, there's no place that I'd rather be. I once heard at a, at a conference last year, I heard somebody say that the feds have all the money, the provinces have all the power and the municipalities have all the problems. And uh, I love a good problem, <laughs> you know, and, and these policy decisions that are happening at different levels, we see them and we live and breathe them every day in our grocery stores and our 
parks, in our uh, community spaces, at our events. So um, again, it, it's just that draw of staying local and um, also supporting my provincial and federal um, counterparts and colleagues to make sure that they're aware of what we're seeing in the local level um, to be informing their policies and their approaches. Before we get to the township of Russell, I want to stick on you for a few seconds, and I want to talk about the role of council, because you were a first-term councillor. You, you got elected in November of 2022. It is now 2024 as we're recording this episode, and I've got to ask, looking back on the first sort of full year, now almost 15 months in office, was it what you expected? Looking at the issues you've sort of had to deal with, was it what you, was it what you expected? That's a great question. I'm a hard worker and I expected that first year to be a lot of work. Um, I had only decided to run a couple of months before the election. So it was a marathon from, from putting my no nomination in to, you know, closing that first budget, uh, that first budget year, I should say. Um, was an absolute marathon and I've never worked harder in my life. And that's saying a lot. I come from a farming background, <laughs> so that's saying a lot. Um, so I expected that. Um, What's there the were most eye-opening experience for yourself? What was the moment when you said, okay, now, now I really have to like up my game a little bit because prior to getting into yeah. politics, I don't care who you are, mm -hmm. uh, you always have a sense of what the role is going to be. But then once you actually get into position, you now control people's mm -hmm. livelihoods in some sense, because the decisions you make at that council table are going to impact them. What was the moment for you when you said, okay, as much as I thought this was going to be hard, it's actually going to be harder because now I'm mm -hmm. going to be impacting residents. Yeah, there that's a great, that's a great follow-up. Thanks for <laughs> nudging me in that direction. Um, the moments where you see what you need to do and what you need to be as a leader. And and there are many ways that you can access mentorship and collaboration and um, brainstorming and supporting other folks that are in leadership roles, hearing from people that are leaders. But it's that moment that you are you come across a difficult decision and you're trying to weigh it and you're trying to say, what is my gut telling me? What is the data telling me? What are residents telling me? And it's those moments where it's really not black and white, you know? And in my life, I usually have a quite, quite a good compass for where I'm going. Um, and so there have been some some shades of gray there where I am making significant decisions and they're not easy decisions to make. So just trying to um, bring in all of the inputs that I can to guide me in that. Um, those are those are big moments. And then the, just the day to day leadership, um, learning about leadership values, tapping into what my leadership values are, living my leadership values is something that's still honestly fairly new to me in a very public way. And so those those are two things that come to mind. Has it been hard to get around the fact that the decisions you make, the hard decisions you have to make, at the end of the day, you have to live by them. You have to stand by them. So you can do all that research that you said. You can go talk to residents. You can look at what administration is putting in front of you. But at the end of the day, you have to make that final choice. Has it gotten easier or is it still hard in the leadership role that you're talking about to make those tough decisions? I think that some decisions should always be hard. <laughs> and I think that that is, I think that that's the beauty of the challenge of it. And the embracing of that challenge and the leaning into that and the humanity that is in that as well is very important to maintain. Um, and so, you know, it, hard decisions, there are very big impactful decisions that are not hard to make for our community. Sometimes it's the, it's the teeniest, tiniest little thing that you get stuck on and you just want to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And it could, it could only impact a small group. Um, yet it's something that I, I put in time to deliberate on and, and, you know, check into the gut, check into the research, check into the, the administration, as you say, of course, and, and the residents it, themselves. Is it hard to keep an open mind going into a council chambers? Because you get your information, you get your agenda package, as every other municipal councillor across this great country does. You look at, you review it, you go out and gauge people's reaction on what they would be wanting to see, whether it be a budget, whether it be a zoning bylaw. 
And then you have to make that decision. So going into that council chambers, you have to sort of have an idea where you're going, but not be so ingrained. How hard is that? Because we are all human and we all mm -hmm. have subconscious, subconscious biases. Is mm -hmm. it hard to go in with an open mind after a year and a half, almost a year and a half? No, I, I, my, my openness, my adaptability, my flexibility is everything to me. And I think that that comes from some of that upbringing that I was referring to earlier, going and yeah. living abroad when I was a young teenager and figuring out how to navigate it. There are some things that I don't, that I reject. Um, I, I reject at the table, um, digging in, uh, you know, getting out of line, breaking relationships, breaking, burning bridges. Um, I will never be doing that at the table. And I've been encouraged to do that <laughs> even in my first year here. And I, um, but so going in with an open mind is part of that is maintaining the relationships and the good positive relationships with other counselors and with the, with the administration, especially as well. Um, it's, I would like to see at our table more conversation, more discussion and back and forth. It's, it, it is difficult when you're being live streamed, the way that we're sitting, even we're sitting we don't sit in a circle like some councils have, have started to do. We sit in a board, which means that you're facing the public, you're facing the administration. You're not necessarily connecting and facing each other. And I was saying, we were talking about this during budget, just our ability to read each other's body language in that setup is severely um, inhibited. So, uh, or limited, I should say. So um there are a lot of things that come into play at the the conversations that we actually have at the council table and i personally i want to work towards having more open uh debate and discussion in good faith with my fellow counselors we do a lot of work we do a lot of good work um but in my nature i'm very collaborative and so having folks that i can discuss back and forth with in a public forum is really important to me uh, open debate is always great and i think that we've lost mm -hmm. the art of that especially on social media um, you talk about dealing with the public and engaging public and asking public for their input on certain issues. Are the people of the township of Russell willing to give their feedback or is there an apathy? So when I talk to municipal leaders, I hear often that there's somewhat of an apathy when it comes to municipal politics. Yes, they'll be paying attention to what's happening at Queen's Park. Yes, they'll be paying attention to what's happening in Ottawa. But locally at home, they're not really paying attention. Do you find that in Russell? I think that the numbers um, in the last election would show a certain degree of apathy. We had very low voter turnout, around 30%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <clears throat> when we looked at that broken down by age demographic, it gets even more concerning when you see that folks that are in my age demographic were even much less likely than 30% to vote. Um, there are a couple of things that I think we have a responsibility to do and, you know, living and breathing and maintaining democracy is near and dear to my heart. And I think that starts at the local level um, in those conversations, those one-on-one -on -one conversations, that door knocking, those phone calls, those emails, those speaking events like I did last night at the Women's Institute. There is a lot of, so there's a lot of apathy. There's a lot of disconnection, but I like to focus on what's working and doing more of that. And in my experience so far, we are still a small enough township that having one-on-one -on -one conversations and relationships um, is available to me and, and at the local level. So I want to be doing more of that. And that's a big part of, of why I'm here, you know, even starting to think about 2026 and who else I want to see on the ballot in 2026. I'm starting to have those conversations now and, and doing my role in the succession planning, which I think is part of a counselor's job as well. I've done many of these interviews and I, I always find it fascinating that a municipal leader in Ontario will say a small township is 16,000. Like any other, any other province, that would be like a city, but only in Ontario, that's a small township. Uh, I, I, I joke for a little bit. Um, I want to turn to the township for a little bit, if you don't mind. And I want to sort of talk about the issues that it's facing because um, it's great to learn about you, but 
we also want to learn about our great communities that we have. And before I ask this question, I preface this all the time. So anyone who's listening knows what I'm about to say. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. She has one vote on counsel and that's it. So counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you see are the biggest issues or issue facing the township of Russell today? I tend to maintain a long-term vision, so I'm going to speak about issues that we are choosing to act or not act upon here um, for future generations specifically. Um, housing is obviously a big one. We can chat about housing. We can skip it. I know there's a lot of housing conversations going on, but two nuggets that are on my mind lately, you know, just over the holidays and as I'm, as I'm going back to council at the end of this month. Um, two of the things on my mind are the, the township as an employer and our ability to attract and retain the skills that we need um, and how we're doing that, uh, our approaches to that, things that we've been trying over the years, maybe other directions that we need to go in as well. And, and the other big one for me is environmental sustainability. So looking at generations to come and seeing, um, you know, our, our watershed produces report cards. We have poor wetlands, we have poor forest cover, we have very poor ground, uh, sorry, surface water quality, and just some of the climate impacts that we're facing here, the storms, um, trees coming down, losing our hydro our resiliency through um, those unfortunate things that are, are coming and will be intensifying. Um, so those are two things that I think about um, that I'm thinking about a lot as 2024 kicks off. So let I want to dive into one of those because you were the first yeah, person on the show. The one. <laughs> the one I, I, want, I want to talk about environmental sustainability because I think this this is you were the first counselor on the show to talk about this so openly. And I agree it's an important issue. What role do you see the municipalities playing in, in protecting our environment and the watersheds that are surrounded by uh, the township of Russell? There's a few ways that we can be doing it. Um, number one, we're working so closely with the province. Um, we have such a close relationship, obviously, through the Municipal Act, through conferences, through our direct conversations with MPPs. Um, in our province right now, there are a lot of concerns around things like watershed approaches to environmental sustainability, um, ensuring that we have potable water, uh, clean air. Um, it, it is. It requires a close relationship with the province, is what I'll say. And not, municipalities do have opportunities to influence uh, and voice concerns to the provincial bodies on these matters. Um, the other one is here at home. What can we be doing as a municipality? And accountability is a huge part of the environmental sustainability conversation for me. Um, another part of my background is I grew up on woodlots. Um, I'm very well versed in, you know, that agricultural and, and forestry um, world. And so um, I'm, I'm of the population that understands what we need from the land, how to maintain good relationship with the land, and how to um, balance needs of humans on land. Um, so accountability, I mean, it's a personal accountability, but in terms of our municipality, I am very proud. I'll list a couple of things that we're doing. We are going to start up our organic co collection in 2025. We will be uh, the only smaller, more rural community uh, in East of Ottawa to do that um, as soon as we will. So I'm very excited on the you know, emissions impact that that will have from our landfill, um, the local landfill that we contract to, I should say. I'm also very proud of our snow dump facility, which has been built and is now in operation, which is helping to keep salt out of our, our local rivers. Um, there's a lot of real, that was, a, that was a big considerable investment that we made, um, you know, to try and maintain uh, the low level of salt in our water um, for the life uh, that, that is in our aquatics and our, those, you know, folks who are using our wells, at the ground wells at the end of the day. Um, so I'm very proud of those steps. I also want to, I want to see some municipal leadership. Um, there were some really interesting projects happening locally around renaturalization of parks and municipal land that is, um, you know, small parcels that are generally being used. Um, I think that we have a huge role and an opportunity to play there in um, 
maintaining our park space, but also renaturalizing some of it and helping folks to access actual natural spaces rather than more sterile green spaces. You know, the health and well-being impacts of that are huge, um, as well as just local habitat and maintaining sustainability here. So that's that's one direction that I would like us to take. And I, as a, you know, it's a counselor's job to maintain a vision. Um, one of my bigger visions is around uh, rural uh, climate change solutions. And there's actually some really interesting leadership out of Alberta as well on uh, climate change solutions solutions for rural areas to be championing that can in, that can benefit our people, that can uh, benefit our economy as well as our environment. So I'm always on the, on the lookout and listening for opportunities in that regard to share with our staff as well, which environment touches every single thing that we do at the end of the day and just making sure that we stay grounded in that and open to different approaches that we could be taking across our functional areas here. The township of Russell is very is is a is a divided township, and I say divided as in there's rural parts and there's urban parts. Now you've just talked about the rural parts, and it's a very big passion for you. It sounds like, how do you balance the needs and wants of two different types of uh, communities? Because there is the rural part, and then there's the urban, the villages that are within the township. And mm -hmm. each each of those communities, each of those parts of the township are going to have their own different uh, issues that are facing them. How do you balance the needs and wants of community members in rural parts compared to urban? Because cost of doing roads in rural uh, Russell is going to be a lot more than it's going to be to do in an urban Russell. Mm -hmm. How because do you do Because you're the not... A, me educate. <laughs> pardon me? Because the connections and the education are a huge part of it, in addition to listening to the different voices and finding the places where there is common interest and making sure that folks understand where that common interest for the best of the municipality um, lands and how that guides our decisions. Um, there, you know, our community has grown by almost 20% since the last census. Um, we're absolutely a booming place. And there are a lot of people who have been here for generations who are very concerned about housing prices, um, their, the look and feel of the villages changing and their rural, um, sort of some of the more traditional organizations, the service clubs, the, um, the curling club, the agricultural society that are really the backbone of, of this place. Um, and I'll, I'll say as well that we are a very bilingual community and my hat's off as well to clubs like uh, Club Richelieu that's dedicated to maintaining Francophone engagement, language and culture here as well um, with an influx of folks from Toronto and Ottawa. Um, so I think that is a big part of the job for me is the connecting and the educating and making sure that people are understanding what's been here for decades and centuries that's worked really well, as well as maintaining the openness to new skills and new innovations and new ways of thinking from the more urban centers that honestly, we're gonna do it together if we're gonna do it well. Um, so I love stitching those two. Um, they're not totally, die, you know, <laughs> opposed views or perspectives, but stitching those strengths together is something that I think is a big part of the role. You talked, and it sort of brings us into the other issue that you talked about, and that is the retention of administration, because with growth mm -hmm. comes expansion. Expansion brings people, you need people to do those jobs, snow removals, people in the administration office. What do you see as the path forward to ensure that the adequate staff stay or the staff members stay not adequate because they're all great. They're all exceptional. I was an administration. I know that they're all great. For those who are listening in Russell, you're amazing. You're doing great. How do you ensure that the people who are there stay and what are you doing? And I'm going to sort of point at you as a counselor doing to ensure that administration feels like they're welcomed, but also their opinions matter because your role as counselor is only one. You, well, you as a counsel only have one employee and that's the CAO or CEO, mm -hmm. or town manager, whatever you want to call it. How do you ensure that all administration feels like they are being heard when you only have one staff member technically? Technically, yes. <laughs> so we have an extremely positive relationship here between council and administration, and it's critical for us to all be working to maintain that. Um, I'm a new counselor. I cannot take 
um, responsibility or, or, you know, claim that that has had much to do with me. But there is a a tone and a precedent that's been set here that we are all working to maintain under what can be very stressful um, environments and decisions and and day-to-day at times. So um, what am I doing? I am remaining open to administration when they say, hey, we think you should have a background on snow removal and how we do it here because we know you're talking to residents. We're going to come to you. We're going to give you the one-on-one, the briefing on how we do snow operations. Um, and you're going to be able to communicate that to residents. And I, I do take that back to residents and, and let them know, you know, this is actually how this is working. This is why the decision's been made. would love to hear if you would have a different approach to this. Um, but just, you know, that connecting and, and educating piece is a big part of it. Um, so that administration feels supported in that work. Um, I think, too, one of the things that I love to do last night, as I said, I was at the Women's Institute and several of the women were offering compliments on, you know, they couldn't believe how fast the township turned around. You know, they had a they had a storm sewer issue. Uh, township staff showed up within three hours of them calling. They let me know that. I get to take that back publicly to administration. The CAO doesn't mind at all when they share that through him. Um, you know, in an email or in a kudos at, at council um, meetings, just to remind people how hard people are working and and um, the exceptional services, frankly, that are being delivered day in and day out under under quite a few constraints. One of the things that I wanted to mention that came, one of the main reasons that I mentioned retention and staffing is that here in Russell Township, we have taken online um, daycare services. Um, Daycare here is a crisis. It's a crisis across Ontario. It's especially being felt here as we've had Um, Most of our development in the past five to 10 years has been single family homes. Guess what? Single family homes means small children uh, who need to be in childcare for their parents uh, safe to be able to get off to work. Um, So that is something that is I'm really passionate about is making sure that we are an employer uh, of daycare uh, providers, daycare professionals. Um, where they can be earning a living wage, um, having the lowest stress possible on the job so that we can be attracting more workers because there's an absolute shortage all across the province. So you have talked about one very big macro issue, which is the environment. You've talked about a sort of a semi-macro micro issue, which is retention and attraction of staff members. But if I go talk to 100 people in the township of Russell, they're Mm -hmm. not going to give me those two issues as their top issues that they see as the issue facing the community. How do you balance the, the, the vision that you have for the community, the vision that council has for the community? Because you've talked about things that are need to be done to set up for the future with the idea that people living here and now have issues as well. They mm-hmm. have that pothole in front of their house that needs to be fixed. They have that sidewalk, that that park that needs to be updated. And now after 15 months in office, you know, municipalities do not have unlimited supply of money as much as people might think they do. They don't. How do you balance the needs and wants of your community with the needs and vision that the council has? That's a great <laughs> question. Like I said, the municipalities have all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They certainly do. Yeah, we have all the juicy problems to work on here. Um, not that we have jurisdiction over everything. Of course, that's not what I'm saying. But we see, we see it. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna here. talk about that jurisdiction. That I'd word jurisdiction to. about two yeah, seconds. Yeah, that'd be a great here. one. That'd be a good one. Okay, so I'll leave that. I'll leave that for now. Um, how do we do it? We have excellent staff that are looking after the day-to-day potholes. So I'll say that making sure that residents know where to go, how to get that pothole fixed. Um, If it's a larger road issue, we have staff that are uh, contracting studies. We have a new road study coming um, that will give us a fresh perspective on where we should be focusing our investment in roads. I know that that roads is obviously the largest one that we hear about on a day-to-day. Um, So I have full confidence in the staff and what they bring to us is a lot of expertise, either from themselves or from uh, experts that have been hired consultants. And I'm very, I have a lot of um, trust in the, in the year and a half or so that I've been here seeing the way that these are 
are strategized about when when do we need a road study how do we need it to impact okay it's going to impact our 2025 and forward budget we're going to get a fresh perspective because driving changes changed during covid people are working from home yada yada um so i think i think what my answer is like writ large to that i'm just thinking aloud here honestly is that when you have very competent staff that are able to bring things forward like that, um, your job as a counselor can really remain at that vision, that strategic plan, that budgetary view. And it's not about directing every single thing that they're doing and every single pothole and every single inch of road that's going to be plowed or paved. It's, it's maintaining the bigger vision. And I just want to say that in Russell Township, because of our staff, because of our financial position, which is fairly strong compared to many across the province, we're absolutely privileged as a council and as an administration to be working. We have we have a fairly positive environment that we're working within for now. And it's one that we want to maintain and we're working to do that. Well, I wish you all the best in maintaining that, but I want to, you, you mentioned my favorite word on this show and that is jurisdiction. <laughs> I am in the belief, and this is just me saying this, for those who are about to send the counselor an email, don't send them to me because this is my opinion. I'm in the opinion that the the average resident, and I say average as in just typical Canadian, doesn't truly understand the jurisdictional role that municipalities play compared to the provincial government and the federal government. Since COVID-19, I would say that municipalities are probably answering more questions about health care, more questions about education, more questions about things that are not in their jurisdictions than they were previous to the COVID-19 pandemic. In your role, you understand them. You understand the jurisdictional rules and areas that you municipalities play in compared to the province. How do you, as a counselor, deal with issues that are not in your jurisdictional purview? Because you are the closest to the people. You are the ones that they know. You are the ones in the community 24-7. So they might not be able to get their MPP online. They may not be able to get their MP on the phone because, God forbid, they actually pick up the phone. But how do you deal with issues not in your jurisdictional purview without seeming like you're not taking the issues that your residents have seriously? It's part of the service um, to be educating, letting them know this is not a township road because here we, we were, we're lower tier. So we have the counties as well. There's four levels here. And the number one confusion is around what is counties versus what is township. I'm very proud, I'll start at that level, I'm very proud here on how the local municipalities, all eight of them under the county level, are working closely with the counties at a staff level, especially to be communicating priorities in terms of design, um, adding a, a street light, um, um, you know, road upgrades, um, clearing operations, the day, the day to day things. Uh, I do get the sense that our staff here has a very good and close connection with the folks working at the county level to make sure that when something comes in here, it is eventually voiced to the counties and taken care of. Um, there are ways to steward that as well as members of council and, and as an administration is doing that education piece on that level. Um, on the provincial and the federal side, what I'll say is that we are still small enough. We have very close relationships between our MPPs, our MPs, and our council members. We're always seeing each other at golf tournaments or banquets or, um, you know, we're, we're all going to be down at Roma Conference, uh, the Rural Ontario Municipal Conference uh, this weekend. Um, we have many opportunities to meet and and collaborate. And I'll just give you an example. When I was running for council, I needed somebody to watch my kids. And my friend said, I'll watch them. Her husband happens to be the MP. <laughs> so, so here I am out knocking on doors and, and our children are having a play date. And, and that's something I'm not saying what my relationship is politically with the MP, because I'm sure there are things we agree on and disagree on and we discuss those. But it really is nice to have that sense of a close knit community where you can pick up the phone to your MPPs or the MPs. I've contacted them about issues that we're seeing at a municipal level that are more federal or provincial in jurisdiction. 
Um, I've also taken the steps as a counselor here to be putting forward support motions when um, organizations like the Association of Municipalities of Ontario are putting forward certain things to the province. Um, uh, th those are, there are many different avenues for us to play. And it just matters to me that at the end of the day, I can go back to residents and say, I know you're concerned about speeding. I'm concerned about too, it too. Here's a motion. I, you know, I can't change the Highway Traffic Act, but I did put in a motion a couple of weeks ago to change this piece of it so that we can get automatic speed enforcement in place. Um, just them knowing that their counselor looks to those other levels and speaks to those levels in the ways that they're available to us, I think is impactful. And it's also my hope that as a member of council, speaking to those representatives that they're that they're listening uh, to the voice because it's my job to make sure that I'm bringing that local voice to them. That is probably the most sincere answer I've ever gotten by asking that question. And the fact that your uh, neighbor's husband is the MP, MP is even more, it just, God bless small town Canada. That's I don't, all I can say. I don't think he changed my son's diaper. I don't <laughs> think it went that way. <laughs> <laughs> but it it matters and it's so important to me that those close relationships are maintained and you know politics can get very ugly especially partisan politics the levels that those folks are playing at and it's really nice to be a nonpartisan municipal councillor just doing that work of of connecting and, and getting the voice where it needs to go for meaningful impactful policy I am cautious of time here and I want to turn to my last segment and this is tourism. It is my favorite segment because I like to learn and I like to tour Canada as much as I love Jamaica. I love sunny places. I love visiting our backyard and I love visiting Canada. So as a tourist coming through Russell Township next year, which I will be doing, or this year, I should say, uh, later in 2024, because I'll be attending the AMO conference, what yeah. should I be visiting in Russell Township? What are the tourist hidden gems in Russell Township, or Township of Russell, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for coming to visit. I'll buy your coffee. Yes. <laughs> um, I would say let's go out on the recreational trail. We have a beautiful converted uh, train to trail, a train track to trail, uh, recreational trail here. It's 10 kilometers, it's tree lined, it's beautiful. It goes through our two largest villages of Edinburgh and Russell. Uh, we can get an ice cream cone at the one end and then we can get an ice cream cone at the other end. <laughs> um, the, it's the recreational spaces, you know, in our in the village of Russell, there are two conservation areas that are very beautiful. Um, one of them backs on to the Castor River, which has a lot of history and was a big part of, of this uh, area being settled. Um, I would also, yeah, just in, encourage the recreational opportunities that abound out here, um, as well as, of course, I, I think Amo is in the fall. If our fall fair is on, that is our number one thing for you to come and see. Um, it's absolutely, it draws thousands and thousands of people to our, our small village of Russell every year. And I'm very proud of the entirely volunteer run project that it is. And I want everybody who's new, who's landing in a small town from a big city because you got out during COVID, I want you to go and, and get engaged and volunteer because you would not believe how much of the magic that happens here locally entirely on volunteer shoulders. And it's, it's really incredible. So where can we find you? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work, where do you go to decompress after a long day and know that you have to do it all again tomorrow, make those tough decisions? Is there a hidden spot in the community that you go and just let it all go? Or are you like every other counselor and say your house and you just decompress there? <laughs> I'm actually going to say last night, I'm going to share a story. I, I went to La Rose Forest, which is a very large forested area of the United Counties of Prescott and Russell. It's not in Russell Township, but it's it's right on Kitty Corner to Russell Township in, in Nation Municipality for the most part. And it was the ladies last night at the Women's Institute, they went late. It was 20 to 10 when they wrapped up, which was amazing. I appreciate their stamina um, for community. And, you know, most of them are, are older. So I was amazed that they weren't all in bed by then. I decided that I was going to stick to my plans and I went over to La Rose Forest for a ski 
and I skied in the forest under the moonlight and under the stars. And it was just so good for me. I was a little bit, I went on my own, which I'm not going to do again, but I can do, uh, it's, it's absolutely so special. And you'd be surprised at how many people come into Russell and aren't aware of um, La Rose Forest, which is an, a total gem in our region. And I want more people to get out there, get active, sweat a little bit, enjoy the winter, enjoy the cold air, um, dress warmly. It's, it's perfect. It's so beautiful. Um, I have one last question and it's the million dollar question. So we started the conversation talking about who Lisa is. So we're gonna end the conversation about what makes Russell, such a unique place. So my question to you to end this interview and take as long as you want, paint a picture for my listeners and my viewers. What makes the township of Russell such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? It is the volunteerism. It's an easy one for me to do. <laughs> to say it's a hundred percent the volunteer energy and the enthusiasm that has been part of our our small villages for centuries. Uh, I I don't think you could ask 10 people in the village of Russell or the M village of Embrin down the street uh, if they volunteer and get one no uh, from minor hockey, from the Agricultural Society putting on the fair. We have an amazing trivia night that's run entirely by volunteers that raises tens of thousands of dollars for local, local causes every month. We have uh, girl guides. We have... Uh, Boy Scouts, we have environmental organizations. Uh, it, it, the list goes on and on and on and on. The volunteerism here is incredible and it's our social capital and our wealth that we have here, uh, no matter what, no matter what shows up in terms of climate change, <laughs> other uh, challenges here that we have as a community, COVID, um, you know, government st struggling financially or on what we're able to deliver. There's a real sense of um, we can get it done when we get it done, when we do it together. And it's it's total. It's just pure magic here. Counselor, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time, 40 minutes out of your day and doing this interview. Um, I truly believe municipal politicians truly have the hardest work to do. They are the ones who are on the front lines of our societies. They are the ones who are on the front lines of our community. And you are the ones making those decisions to make our communities better. So I want to thank you for not only doing the show, but serving your community. I don't think municipal politicians hear that enough, but I want to say that more often. So thank you so much for all you do and for coming on the show and talking about yourself and the Township of Russell. Thank you so much, Chris, for helping the different municipal storytellers and counselors serving across our country to tell their stories. Um, let's get more people on the ballot. Let's get more people engaged, more people at committees, more people calling me at all hours of the day. I'm here for it. And it's, it's truly an honor and a privilege. So thank you. Now today's episode sparked your interest. Hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to in-depth interviews on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we're your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed and engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of our top-notch content you love. So if you can, please consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.